I am Valentin Fuster from New York, and it's a pleasure to have um, <clears throat> this session this morning following the scientific sessions of the American College of Cardiology in New Orleans. As usual, we are going to present a number of topics that we think were important, particularly related to trials. And I have three experts here who are going to help us in judging the outcomes of such trials. Here on my right is Dr. Pamela Morris, who is the Paul Palmer Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Director of the Sainzheimer Cardiovascular Health Program at the Medical University of South Carolina. We have also Dr. Patrick Parrino from New Orleans, Chief of the Section of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery at the Oxner Health System. And then in my left, I have Dr. Edward Fry, President of the American College of Cardiology and Chair of the National Cardiovascular Service Line, Ascension Health. Well, it's going to be interesting discussion here. We have a number of studies that were presented, and hopefully we can make sense about the four main topics that were presented. First, about valvular heart disease. Second, about metabolic diseases. About third, atherothrombotic problems. And fourth, about pulmonary hypertension. So we are ready? Let's go. All right. It. Let's move on. Let's start now with the valvular heart disease. And the first study that we are going to discuss <clears throat> is the uh, co-opt study, the co-opt investigators. Uh, this was published uh, now in the New England Journal of Medicine and is entitled Five-Year Follow-Up After Transcatheter Repair of Secondary Mitral Regurgitation. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Greg Stone, and we are all familiarized with the co-opt study, but I will give some background. Um, the co-opt co compare with uh, optimal medical therapy with transcatheter H2H -H repair and was safe and improved two-year outcome in patients with heart failure with secondary mitral regurgitation who remain symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy. Whether these benefits are sustained with long-term follow-up has not been reported. So the report was about a two-year follow-up, and here we have the five-year follow-up. Let's see what the report says. They randomized 614 heart failure patients with moderate to severe or severe secondary mitral regurgitation who remain symptomatic despite maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy. And this uh, was compared with medical therapy alone. The study was performed in 78 sites in the United States and Canada. And the primary effectiveness and point was of all hospitalizations for heart failure through two years of follow-up. Final follow-up through five years is what is reported today. The annualized rates of heart failure hospitalization through five years were 33% per year per patient in the device group and 57% uh, per year for patients in the control group. Uh, very significant, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.53. All-cause mortality through five years occurred in 57% of the device group versus 67% of the control group. And then finally, death or hospitalization for heart failure through five years occurred in 73% of the device group versus 91.5% of the control group with a hazard ratio of 0 0.53. So in conclusion, in patients with heart failure and moderate to severe or severe secondary mitral regurgitation who remain symptomatic despite guideline-directed medical therapy, transcatheter H2H repair of the mitral valve was safe and reduced the rates of heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause mortality through five-year follow-up. I could begin asking a surgeon what the surgeon thinks about all of these, but I like to prefer to talk to you, Ed. What do you think about this study? Well, I, I think it's uh, confirmatory of the uh, durability of the initial positive results. Um, I think it's also a, a, a testimony to the fact that uh, uh, trying to do trials when so many things are changing at the same time some of the follow-up of this trial took place during COVID, and we know that that has had a significant impact uh, 
in other trials in terms of the measurement of hospitalizations for heart failure, that those hospitalizations had been reduced by the intention of keeping people out of the hospital during COVID. So the fact that there is this uh, uh, significant difference is probably actually underestimates its, its, uh, its uh, value. Um, and we also had the, the evolution of uh, guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure during this period of time with the onboarding of SGLT2 inhibitors, which probably were used, uh, uh, used in the latter part of the, of the follow-up. So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it confirms the, the fact that this is an important uh, intervention for patients who have truly failed guideline-directed medical therapy and uh, gives us some, uh, uh, some uh, confidence that that result is durable. But these are very, very sick patients given the fact of how many have either died at the end of the trial or continue to have need for hospitalization. This is my question, Pamela. Uh, you know, the, the data is 91% of the control group patients and 73% of the device group patients had either died, as Ed mentioned, or been hospitalized for heart failure within five years. So we are dealing with a very sick population, though. That's, the mo that's one of the most important pieces of data, I think, that comes out of that study, is it really confirms how incredibly high risk these patients are. Certainly, the, the benefits are that these patients did have at least some prolonged survival at five years, but what a high risk group of patients. I have the feeling that what we are doing is to improve the quality of life, perhaps, mm -hmm. rather than paying too much attention into mortality. Patrick, you are a surgeon. What do you think? Well, I have <clears throat> several thoughts about this, and I think primarily I think this is a terrific thing. Um, you know, there's just this awfully tedious cliche that for secondary MR, is it a disease of the valve or a disease of the ventricle? And we've all heard that ad nauseum. Um, but that's clearly what this is. And for these patients, we're not looking for a 10-year result, right? They're, if this many of them are dead at five years, they're all going to be dead at 10 years. And so looking for an intermediate term result, the CLIP is a great solution for those patients. And in particular, where we've found this to be helpful, as is a bridge to transplant or as a bridge to LVAD, if these patients can be palliated essentially with this CLIP, then that buys them some time for GDMT. And then when they do eventually progress, uh, the LVAD operation is much more straightforward with a CLIP in place, or the heart transplant operation is much more straightforward with a CLIP in place as opposed to a valve replacement, which is probably, I hate to use the term, overkill for these patients, because they don't need that durable of a result. The CLIP is a much better solution. So, so basically what advocate. we are saying is a plus study, and I think quality of life, I think, is important, uh, but certainly this is a very sick population. Yes. Well, with this conclusion, uh, we have more to say now about valvular heart disease. Let's move into the tricuspid valve. What do you think, Patrick? This is a, is a new field, isn't it? The tricuspid valve has been forgotten. Uh, not completely forgotten. All right, all we... right. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's now go into the study. We're going to present now the uh, Triluminate study. Uh, this is a study that um, uh, is entitled, uh, as published in the New England Journal of Medicine today, is transcatheter repair for patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Dr. Paul uh, Soreje from uh, Minneapolis was the one who presented the study. Let's be, perhaps go into some background of this tricuspid valve. I don't know, I, I evolved over the years always thinking that the tricuspid valve is something that you deal with after mitral valve, at the time of mitral valve intervention. Patients have tricuspid regurgitation secondary to pulmonary hypertension. We have to discuss in a moment who are the patients that are being treated here. But let's go into, into what is historically important. Is, uh, both American and European guidelines, uh, they say tricuspid valve surgery is a cl class one recommendation only for patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation at the time of left-sided surgery. This is what we were saying. A second point is that in 2021, the ESC, EACTS guidelines additionally include symptomatic patients with severe isolated primary tricuspid regurgitation without severe right ventricular dysfunction as a class one recommendation for tricuspid valve surgery. This is closer to the study that we are going to be presenting in a minute. 
And the, the, pre the, the, the problem has been, it seems to me, uh, at least what you read in the literature is that tricuspid surgery uh, carries some high mortality, uh, 8 to 10 percent. Maybe this is exaggerated, but this is what has been historically the thought is you keep conservative in the tricuspid valve. Anyway, uh, Patrick says he's, he's in disagreement with that. Well, he's a good surgeon, but the reality is that in the literature, tricuspid valve intervention as an isolated is some problems with mortality. Well, recently, treatment of tricuspid regurgitation with transcatheter H2H repair has emerged as a safe and potentially effective therapy. And let's see what this study is telling us, because it's a unique study, perhaps the first one in a large number of patients. And let's now describe what the study is all about. Triluminate uh, Pivotal is the first prospective randomized control trial to assess the impact of transcatheter intervention for tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, the investigators enrolled patients with symptomatic severe tricuspid regurgitation at 65 centers in the United States, Canada, and Europe. The patients were randomly assigned to either tricuspid transcatheter H2H repair or medical therapy. The primary endpoint was a hierarchical composite of all cause mortality, tricuspid valve surgery, heart failure hospitalization, and quality of life by the KCCCQ approach, the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. 350 patients with a mean age of 78 years, 55% were women, were enrolled. The scattered tricuspid repair was highly effective with moderate or less than residual regurgitation at 30 days post-procedure. 87% in the, um, in the intervened group with good tricuspid plication versus 4.8% in the control patients. The primary endpoint of the trial was met, indicating significant clinical benefit of this procedure in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. The benefit was predominantly related to symptomatic relief and quality of life improvement. In fact, this is a short follow-up of one year. So basically, in conclusion, tricuspid uh, 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 approach with this uh, non-surgical intervention is safe and effective for patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation and associated with significant improvement in quality of life. Pamela, I, I have a few questions about this study. First of all, and I, and I had to ask the investigators this, how many patients actually were previously operated for mitral valve disease or intervened with H2H approach? 20%. So we have 80% of patients who have what appears to be isolated tricuspid regurgitation. What I'm saying, these patients are not common. In other words, I want to be sure that people don't think, now tricuspid regurgitation, we are going to do this and that. In fact, everyone. I don't think it's a large population. What do you think? I think your point is well taken. I mean, this is, a, this is that will be one of the challenges of implementing this procedure is I think really identifying the right patient for the procedure, particularly in light of the fact that the benefit is largely driven by quality of life. So I think careful patient selection uh, is going to be one of the most important aspects. Patrick, what do you think? Uh, these are patients with tricuspid prolapse. Tell me what, what kind of patient do you think is here? Because patients didn't have pulmonary hypertension, at least the pulmonary artery pressures were less than 70. I don't know if they had mitral valve disease or not. Is is unclear. But yes. what do you think? I think it's a godsend. Um, when I was at Cleveland Clinic, my friend Ed McGee looked at the Cleveland Clinic data for reduced sternotomy and tricuspid valve operation, and the mortality was 33 mm percent. -hmm. It's awful. And one thing they didn't, at least in the limited stuff that I saw, comment upon was the degree of hepatic dysfunction that these patients have. Mm -hmm. But many of them have significant hepatic congestion or full-on, you know, old-term cardiac cirrhosis. And so they're awful operative candidates. And they can be quite symptomatic with severe TR. And so I think in particular patients who've had previous sternotomy, this is a wonderful solution from a symptomatic approach. I'm not so sure if they have concomitant other valvular disease, if it's the best thing. But for isolated TR, especially in a post-operative patient, I think it's wonderful. I think, Ed, that uh, we are talking again
about improvement in quality of life. Uh, I suspect that in a long follow-up, maybe these patients will live longer, but I think the, the, the effects on quality of life are probably very significant here. I would agree. I mean, the uh, KCCQ, and they used a very aggressive endpoint of 15 uh, <coughs> points of improvement, and most people seem to consider 10, 10 points improvement as being uh, uh, a marker of improved quality of life. So I would agree, and, and isn't that what we do a lot in practice? We really are focused on making people feel better uh, uh, as, as their, their most valued uh, outcome. And it's great to see a patient-reported outcome be really part of the, really be the pivotal part of the trial. So it seems to me that we are dealing with two studies, one in the mitral valve with secondary mitral regurgitation, and this particular one in tricuspid valve, most of the patients, I suspect, had primary tricuspid regurgitation in which uh, what we are really coming up uh, after this meeting is quality of life may be improved. Let's see what happens long term in terms of mortality. Is this correct? Okay. Yes, I think so. Yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm wary of any tier approach that doesn't obviously include an annuloplasty because for most valve repairs, annuloplasty is a really important component of durability. So we'll see how it does over time. Can I ask your prediction about the tricuspid valve? Do you think this is going to be the key technology? Because, you know, there are so many other non-surgical interventions with, uh, that now are evolving. Do you think this is going to be a critical one? I do. I think it's going to work well over the short and intermediate term. Long term, again, without an annuloplasty band, I'm not confident. But again, for this patient group of 78-year-olds, we're not looking for a long-term result. I, I would be interested to, to ask about, you know, one of the um, exclusions or, or the, the, the group of patients who undergo mitral edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair and exclusion are people who have severe TR. Does this now open the door to bring that group of patients into you know, being candidates for interesting. Uh, for mitral tear. An interesting comment. Yeah. I think, I, I think so. Happen. I think in particular for cardiomyopathy patients, again, is a is a bridge to something else, yeah. whether it's transplant or if they're later in life as a quality of life measure. Yeah. A, a double tier approach for both AV valves would be a reasonable thing. Yeah. Well, let's move on into the third topic in valvular heart disease. <clears throat> now we are moving to the aortic valve. What a field, you know, valvular <laughs> heart disease. A few years ago, we talked about rheumatic disease. So is that right? Mitral <laughs> stenosis and then uh, certainly aortic stenosis in the elderly. But <laughs> here today is just like an explosion. Very positive. Well, let's go into the third paper. And it's about the low risk tower uh, group. And it's entitled Three Year Outcomes After Transcatheter or Surgical Aortic Valve Replacement in low-risk patients with aortic stenosis. <clears throat> this was presented by Dr. Uh, Dr. John Forrest from the Yale University School of Medicine in New Haven. Well, you know, we all have been worried about moving into low-risk patients with this kind of interventions, and we'll have a discussion about it. But let me, let me introduce the subject. Uh, much of the data supporting uh, TAVR has been in patients with increased risk for surgery. And recent data on low-risk patients' populations for those uh, promising short-term outcomes is evolving, but with some worries. Uh, there is a lack of uh, intermediate or longer-term data for such patients. And let me see what the study that is presented today is going to tell us. It's a three-year follow-up. Let me, let me focus into the study. The evolute low-risk trial randomized patients with severe aortic stenosis who had an indication for aortic valve replacement and were low risk at surgery to either TAVR or surgery. All patients in the involute low-risk trial have now completed three years of follow-up. In fact, if I recall, they published their data over the two years of follow-up. This is a three-year follow-up. Well, let's go into the details of the study. Low-risk patients were randomized to TAVR with a self-expanding supraannular valve or surgery. The primary endpoint was all-cause mortality or disabling a stroke, and several secondary endpoints were assessed at three years. Many, many groups participated in the study, 80, 86 sites in seven countries. Uh, the number of patients that were randomized were uh, 1,414. 
patients had a mean age of 74 years and 35% were women. At three years, the primary endpoint occurred in 7.4% of the TAVR group patients and 10.4% of the surgery patients with a p-value <laughs> of 0 0.051. Close to significant, mm -hmm. not significant. Well, anyway, this is the data. The incidence of mild paravalvular regurgitation in 20% of the TAVR group versus 2.5% of the surgery group. I have to say, however, that significant paravalvular regurgitation was equal in both groups. This is very mild. And the pacemaker placement is important, 23% in the TAVR group versus 9% in the surgery group. Uh, there were, um, anyway, this is the data. So pacemaker is an issue. Patients who underwent TAVR had significantly improved valve hemodynamics. Well, a mean gradient of nine millimeters of mercury for TAVR versus 12 millimeters of, of uh, mercury for surgery. It's a short follow-up and no, uh, I don't think this is important at this point. But the conclusions are that within the Evolute Low Risk Study, TAVR at three years showed durable benefits compared to surgery with respect to all-cause mortality or disabling stroke. Uh, Patrick, uh, this is important, but it always brings some worries, and that is the enthusiasm for non-surgical interventions is getting now into younger people with severe aortic stenosis, but uh, what is the outcome? Give well, us your the, feeling about <clears throat> this that's approach. That's my concern. I think low risk doesn't necessarily mean young. There's plenty of low risk octogenarians. And my concern, I think this is a wonderful solution for patients in their 70s and their 80s. I think it's a great thing. But having done operations for patients in their 50s who received transcatheter valves, you're kind of kicking the can down the road. That, that you know, device the aorta grows into that device. And often when we reoperate on those patients or operate on those patients, it necessitates a root replacement rather than a valve replacement, which is known to be a higher risk yeah. operation. And so I would be cautious about equating low risk to young, because those are not the same thing. Yeah. Ed, you are age 50. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. A surgeon comes to you and an interventionist and says, you know, your uh, aortic valve has to be replaced. You are in great shape, but you have severe aortic stenosis. What would be your answer based on the study? Well, I'd, I'd want to understand my relationship with the person I'm having the discussion with because I think this is critical. The sequencing issue, thinking ahead, of, uh, hopefully you're talking about 30, 40 years of uh, uh, having, uh, you know, an active life beyond that. You'd really want to understand what does the surgeon or the interventional cardiologist, what are they going to say to you in terms of what is the plan down the road? I want to know, so in 15 years, what's going to happen? What's in 30 years, what's going to happen? And I would, that would be a very important shared decision-making moment. Pamela, what is your thinking? So, you know, I think two thoughts with this study. One is that it really highlights the importance of the, the, stru the structural team um, and the importance of the surgeon and the interventional structural cardiologist to really adequately communicate uh, the long term, uh, the long term or potential outcomes. The other issue is really being honest about the risk of a permanent pacemaker. So you maybe don't get an, a surgical procedure, but you end up with a, a permanent pacemaker. So uh, again, I think the team approach and the importance of shared decision making, that's been a dramatic evolution in our management with these patients. So I think we can summarize, I don't know if you are in agreement that um, we have to go forward on every aspect of valvular heart disease and thinking about non-surgical intervention. But I think this particular one, I think we have to be cautious. Is not correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I think we already had information that these devices are, are fairly durable, certainly in this relatively short period of a follow-up, it all comes down to, I mean, it's interesting that the average age of the patients in this trial was 74. So that's a very different conversation, as Patrick was saying, than if you're 50. But it's important, Patrick, what you said, I think, that for the very elderly patient, mm -hmm. this may be a procedure, age 80, 85, even age 90, and, and so forth. 
Well, let's see how this uh, field is, uh, is, uh, is being approached in the near future. But anyway, this is the third three-year follow-up. Well, we are done with valvular heart disease. We touch into three valves. We miss one, it's pulmonary valve, but let's forget uh, for today. Uh, but these are interesting studies. And now we are entering into a new topic is, uh, we call metabolic diseases. Just, just uh, something that you like, Pamela. I and, do. Uh, and but <laughs> let's, let's start with uh, an interesting study, which is the CLEAR study. Uh, the CLEAR study uh, entitled Benpedoic Acid and Cardiovascular Outcomes in Statin Intolerant Patients. The study was presented by Dr. Stephen Neeson uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. And it's interesting, and uh, this is in patients who they were intolerant to statins, mainly because of the problems that we know, the muscular problems, and so forth. Let's now give some introduction to this uh, particular study. Be first of all, what is ben benpedoic acid? Actually, this was approved, I think, by the FDA about, uh, about three or four years ago. Is this correct? And this is basically targets the synthesis of cholesterol more proximally than the enzyme, the coenzyme reductase that, uh, we, well, by we, we, use, we use statins. Uh, just to prevent the synthesis, so it's more proximal. And what is interesting is that um, statin work in many organs, and actually one of the organs that works is in the muscles, where this drug actually doesn't get there. All the metabolic aspects are in the liver. So it's interesting, theoretically speaking, that patients who are intolerant to statins because of muscular problems, at least this drug, again, theoretically speaking, uh, could be of help. And there are some preliminary studies, and this is why the FDA approved the drug, showing that this could be an alternative to patients who have statin intolerance. This being said, let's now go into the details of the study. <clears throat> this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial involving patients who were unable or unwilling to take statins owing to unacceptable adverse effects, so-called statin intolerance and had or were a high risk for cardiovascular disease. So these patients were a high risk for cardiovascular disease. This is important. Oral benpedoic acid, which is 180 milligrams daily, or placebo, was the randomization all about. The primary endpoint was a four-component composite of measured adverse cardiovascular events defined as death from, from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, or coronary revascularization. Uh, 1,200 sites participated in the study, 32 counties, and this is a very large study, near 14,000 patients participated. Well, the median duration of follow-up was 40.6 months. The mean LDH cholesterol level at baseline was 139 mill milligrams per DL, per DL in both groups. And after six months, the reduction in the level was greater with benpedoic acid than with placebo by 29 milligrams per DL, and the observed difference in the percent reduction was 21%. The incidence of a primary endpoint, which is the importance here, uh, was significantly lower with benpedoic acid than with placebo, 11.7% versus 13.3%. So benpedoic acid had no significant effects on fatal or non-fatal stroke, death from cardiovascular causes, and death from any cause. So the incidence of gout and cholelithiasis were higher with benpedoic acid than with placebo, 3.1% uh, versus 2.1%. And I'd like to conclude by saying that among statin intolerant patients, reductions in LDL cholesterol levels with benpedoic acid were associated with a lower risk of measured adverse cardiovascular events. This is basically an interesting study. It, I, had a, I had a question here. There were four endpoints, or a composite of four endpoints, but it seems that revascularization was a critical endpoint that right. we have to look for, and also it appears myocardial infarction. The other endpoints with bad death or, or um, stroke didn't play a role here. Right. So tell us about the study. 
Well, I think it's uh, uh, impressive in, to actually see that level of improvement in terms of revascularization and MI in a relatively short period of time. Sort of supports our feeling that uh, the lower the LDL cholesterol, the better the clinical out, uh, the outcome will be, and reinforces the idea that we're seeing plaque stabilization, which would really be the underlying mechanism driving urgent revascularization and myocardial infarction. I think the biggest point here, I think, I'd be interested to hear what Pam has to say. I think we perhaps now, in patients who are truly statin intolerant, and that, that's a question, um, is that uh, now we do really don't have an excuse to just say, well, that's too bad, you know, uh, good luck to you. I think now we have an imperative to, to really try and address their LDL cholesterol. Pam, you are in this field. <clears throat> the drug was approved in 2020. Are you using it? Yes, I am. You know, the biggest obstacle to this to this drug is really just the cost issue. I was going to ask you. That's the biggest issue, yeah. is really getting it, as with most payers um, initially when a drug is released, um, even when you prescribe it for someone who meets the FDA-approved indications, it can be difficult. Um, it is interesting. It has, um, it, it can be very effective, and when used in combination with azetamide, mm -hmm. you really do get reductions that are quite similar to um, high-intensity statin. Um, so it, it has been very beneficial. It also provides an option for patients when you're really um, on that edge between an injectable therapy or an oral therapy. The combination really does give you an option for patients. So, so Patrick, did you hear about benpedoic acid before? Yes. And I thought it was interesting um, because I tried to look it up, and I'm not aware that it has some of the anti-inflammatory properties that the statins have. So I thought it was interesting that it provided the same kind of stabilization mm -hmm. without the anti-inflammatory piece. But from a surgical <coughs> standpoint, you know, I, it's exhausting having people tell you they think the veins are all going to wear out in 10 years because all that data is prior to even the advent of statin therapy. And mm -hmm. so to have something else that improves the durability of vein grafts is a great thing because that's a palliative operation and the more effective that palliation is, the better. So I think mm -hmm. it's terrific that this is an option for people. Mm -hmm. So good option, but somewhat expensive. Is this a good conclusion? And hopefully though with this study, hopefully with the results of this study, this will end with time, this will become, we now have outcomes data and hopefully it will be easier to get it approved and hopefully with time the cost will begin to come down much like the PCSK9 monoclonals. This is through pressure, through pressure to industry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We, we have learned a definitely. lot, isn't it? Definitely. Uh, <laughs> but the, in the discussion, it was very interesting. One of the topics that came up is that, we, you know, is there a concern that it is now too easy of an off-ramp in terms oh, of de defining somebody who is statin intolerant? Right. You know, how hard do you really work at, at that? In I terms think that's of, a great point. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And now we are going to the second paper on metabolic aspects. Here is the STOP CAA trial, statins to prevent the cardiotoxicity for anthracy from anthracyclines. Uh, the paper was presented uh, by Dr. Thomas uh, Nalen from the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And let's see what this is all about. Well, we know about the cardiotoxicity of anthracyclines. Uh, this drug, uh, or these drugs, I would say, are used for several cancers, breast cancer, lymphoma particularly, leukemia, and sarcoma. And uh, it's certainly a concern to the cardiologists uh, because the, it causes cardiac injury, and, uh, which is, can be very significant. Well, in any case, uh, there is some experimental data or retrospective studies pointing out that the statins could be helpful in preventing the effects of anthracyclines into the myocardium. And this is the study, uh, perhaps the largest study, on this topic uh, with the use of atorvastatin. Uh, it's interesting that there is a recent multicenter randomized trial of atorvastatin versus placebo with a 24 months of follow-up, and left ventricular ejection fraction did not change, it was 58% in the placebo group and 58% in the atorvastatin group. And this is an interesting uh, 
piece of information, as we will see in a moment. So we are dealing with a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in patients with lymphoma over the age of 18 years. Uh, there were nine centers in the United States and Canada that participated in the study. So let's see what the details of the study were all about. Well, first of all, the primary outcome is interesting. The proportion in each group who had a decline in left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 10% to less than 55%. So the ejection fraction has to drop more than 10% and finally, less than 55% should be the ejection fraction. A secondary endpoint is the same, but instead of 10%, we talk about 5%. And you have to drop uh, to less than 55% ejection fraction. These were the endpoints, safety endpoint, adverse events of, of uh, specific interest. Well, what we are talking about? We are talking about 300 patients. They were randomized into 40 milligrams, 150 patients, 40 milligrams of atorvastatin per day, and then the 150 patients were all allocated to placebo control. Uh, the follow-up, 12 months. Results, the first look is very impressive. The incidence of the primary endpoint at 12 months was 9% in the atorvastatin group, 22% in the placebo group. Great results. You go into ejection fraction, and then the situation looks a little bit different, Pamela. You start with an ejection fraction that are starting group of 63%, <clears throat> and you drop it to 59%. In the placebo group, you start with uh, 63%, and you drop it to 57%. So we are talking about ejection fractions that we feel comfortable, no? In our mm -hmm. practice. And then the difference between one group and the other is 1.3%. So the question is that the summary or the conclusions of the study, which they go to the primary endpoint, the prophylactic use of atorvastatin over 12 months was associated with a lower ra rate of cardiac systolic dysfunction. These data support the use of atorvastatin among patients with lymphoma being treated with anthracyclines where prevention of cardiac systolic dysfunction is important. I have questions about these conclusions. What do you think, Pamela? Well, you know, it's interesting because the study was not actually powered to look at the clinical results of a reduction in ejection fraction. So not being powered to look at heart failure outcomes limits what I can take away from this clinically. It also opens up for me as a as a prevention enthusiast it, and using statins, it opens up a whole new group of patients for whom I now need to be concerned yeah. about statin intolerance and statin tolerability and optimal dosing. Um, other cancers, you know, um, it's, con it, is, uh, it is of interest. So um, hard to know what to make of it in the setting of no clinical um, understanding of what that ej modest ejection fr fraction yes, change means. Patrick, you are a surgeon. We talk about the ejection fractions. You know, it's reasonable. So what do you think about this, the, the information of this, uh, this paper? I want so much for it to work, but I don't think that I can say that it works based on that paper. Mm -hmm. um, those are very difficult patients when they present with heart failure <clears throat> after having been treated successfully to one degree or another for malignancy, and our our opportunities are limited as far as LVAD and transplant go with this patient population, so I would really like for this to work. But I can't read that paper and be confident that this is gonna work based Ed, on the data. Thank you. So. Ra raises more questions than it answers, I think. And uh, as, as uh, Dr. Morris was saying, the issue of uh, not knowing enough about the clinical outcomes. I mean, the, the, the trial was really looking at heart failure. We know that half of heart failure is preserved ejection fraction heart failure, right? And then half is reduced ejection heart failure. Um, I guess, uh, and, and in the trial, we also saw one of the questions that came up was the dosing of the anthracycline was relatively high. Yeah. And in the subgroup analysis, it looked like if if you were below a certain level, you didn't derive any apparent benefits. So 
maybe this turns out to be something that would be helpful in those higher risk patients getting a larger dose of the anthracycline. I guess we also have to turn it around and say all of these patients had some reduction in their ejection fraction, so there's, you know, there's something going on there. And if the downside of atorvastatin is minimal or zero, maybe in terms of the overall management of these patients, it's not an unreasonable thing to think about, especially if they're going to get a high dose of the anthracycline. So I also still have questions about this, this whole concept mechanistically um, in terms of you know, the reduc yes, the, there are reductions in inflammation, reductions in HSCRP, um, but mechanistically, what do we think is going on here is, is still unclear to me. I suspect, long, we'll, I suspect we'll see some publications further from the MRI analysis and to see if there's any delayed contrast enhancement mm -hmm. change. So in conclusion, an interesting paper. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Let's leave it there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The next paper, and I cannot, of, I, I, I cannot have any bias into it <laughs> because I was the PI of the paper. And in fact, is the um, anticoagulant strategies in non-critically ill patients hospitalized with COVID-19, a randomized clinical trial. Well, you know that the thrombotic phenomena in the microcirculation and the large circulation has been one of the issues uh, in COVID. And uh, so we did some first retrospective studies in which we really look at anticoagulation, therapeutic anticoagulation, which was um, of some benefit in the retrospective studies that we did on Mount Sinai. But this led to the prospective study that I'm going to be presenting here. The, um, so we sought to determine the safety and effectiveness of therapeutic dose of anticoagulation in non-critical hospitalized patients with COVID, as I mentioned. The patients hospitalized with COVID-19 non requiring intensive care unit treatment were randomized to prophylactic dose of enoxaparin and therapeutic dose of enoxaparin or therapeutic dose of apixaban. It's interesting because this is one of the studies that we use an oral agent and apixaban for the issue of COVID and thrombogenicity. The primary outcome was the 30-day composite of all-cause mortality, requirement for ICU level of care, systemic thromboembolism, or ischemic stroke, assessing the combined therapeutic dose group compared with the prophylactic dose group. So we compare both therapeutic groups of, um, of enoxaparin and apixaban versus the prophylactic group of enoxaparin. Uh, this study was carried out uh, between August of, two th uh, of uh, 2020 and September of 2022. The patient is a large study in terms of uh, 3,398 non-critically ill patients. Again, they were hospitalized with COVID, were randomized to what I mentioned, to the prophylactic dose of enoxaparin versus the two therapeutic dosages of uh, of apixaban and enoxaparin. 76 centers participated in the study in 10 countries. The 30-day primary outcome occurred in 13% of patients in the prophylactic dose and in 11% of patients with uh, the combined therapeutic dose. The results didn't reach a statistical significance. Then we have <clears throat> the secondary endpoint. One was all-cause mortality occurring in 7% of the patients treated with prophylactic dose of enoxaparin versus 4.9% of patients treated with therapeutic dose of anticoagulation. This was highly significant. Intubation was also highly significant, 8% versus 6%. And so the combination of, um, of both, uh, and that is the, uh, the intubation and then the other aspects that I mentioned. So uh, I have to conclude that among non-critically ill patients hospitalized with COVID-19, the 30-day primary composite outcome was not significantly reduced with therapeutic dose of anticoagulation. Uh, however, when we look at the issue of mortality and, 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 and intubation, the results were highly significant. So just of interest to say that um, in the United States, the study, the primary endpoint was superior than to India. 
mm. which really uh, mm. the outcomes were very, very low. So this is one aspect that uh, 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 it is important to mention. And the other aspect that is important to mention is that the patients who had lung disease with chest X-ray, with, with CT, ARDS, again, the results were superior in the primary endpoint with, um, with the use of anticoagulation. Anyway, this is open to discussion. Pam? May I ask you a question? Um, was there any relationship, you know, over that period of time, there were changes in the, the prevalent COVID variant? Yeah. Have you looked at, or do you, do you know if there were any differences? Yeah. We know yes. that the... The results are more significant in the first part of the study than in the second part of the study. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the issues that we, we kept going to meet the number of patients mm -hmm. that, we want, that we wanted were more than 3,000. And this delayed the study, and, and at the very end, we ended up with a second part in which the incident rate of events was decreased. So mm -hmm. if we had started, I think, much earlier, right. probably the results would be different. Very interesting. Yeah. Patrick? Well, I agree with what you said. I think, you know, we certainly saw COVID early here in New Orleans in March of 20, and the uh, thrombolytic complications were much worse. And I think many of these patients had micropulmonary emboli that may not show up on a CTA or something like that, but I think that played a huge role in some of their outcomes. And so I think anticoagulation is important, but just with the variation in the virus and international variations in care, I think it's difficult to extrapolate the data to whatever comes next. Ed? Well, I think it underscores also the importance of in the trial construction of the here where the actually the secondary endpoints ended up being probably more important than the composite, the composite endpoint in terms of uh, uh, analyzing the study. Um, I think it also points out that uh, in clinical practice, it's so important for us to individualize the care of the patient. So if you have somebody who is, has demonstrated lung involvement or prior lung disease, uh, other uh, increased risks for thromboembolic problems and balancing it with their, their bleeding risk, at least we have some information now to help us make that decision a little bit better. There's a statistical point which I think is of interest, and that is we look at the first event of the four composite endpoints, and the first event was intubation, which overshadowed the mortality. So this is very important from the statistical point of view. If you do, if you do, if you do the opposite, you say, well, the most important is mortality, and you start from mortality, and then mm -hmm. you... Right. So, but th these are things that... Uh, that are, are interesting. But anyway, um, I think the study is the largest study, and I think um, our conclusion is that this has to be individualized, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, in particularly in patients who present with lung problems. So they are at high risk, but not necessarily go to an intensive care unit, the therapeutic mm -hmm. approach versus the prophylactic approach. You know, it's important. This study had to be done in the sense that through much of COVID, um, we were sort of flying by the seat of our pants with throwing anything and everything and um, without randomized controlled uh, data. This study had to be done, and um, I'm, I'm glad that these results are published. Well, it was uh, investigator-driven. Hmm. <laughs> you know, we have to get the funds to do this study. Where industry was not involved at all, mm -hmm. so we, we feel good about it. Thank you very much. So let's now move into, um, uh, I guess, is um, the other study, oh yes, is the BioVasc study. Very interesting. Uh, this is a study presented by Dr. Diletti from the Rotterdam, and is complete revascularization strategies in patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome and multivessel coronary artery disease. Uh, it's an interesting topic. Uh, we all know that a uh, large number of patients with acute coronary syndromes actually present with multivessel disease, certainly more than 50%. In multiple studies have established the clinical benefit of complete coronary revascularization as compared with the uh, exclusive reperfusion of the culprit lesion. The question has been about the timing. The optimal timing for the non-culprit lesion revascularization is actually uh, remains unclear. So the primary objective of the BioVasc trial was to investigate whether an immediate complete revascularization is non-inferior to a stage complete revascularization strategy. 
and the primary outcome is the composite of all cause mortality, myocardial infarction, any unplanned ischemia-driven revascularization, and cerebrovascular events at one year post-index procedure. Number of patients in the study, about 1,500. Culprit lesion was clear, so the other arteries were looked at. And then here we come that the immediate complete revascularization during the index procedure was done in over 700 patients and was a stage approach with revascularization within six weeks in the other over 700 patients. The composite primary endpoint, I repeat, all cause mortality, myocardial infarction, any implant driven ischemic revascularization, and cerebrovascular events at one year. Well, the results were actually interesting. In terms of the primary endpoint, um, it was a superiority uh, of uh, doing the procedure at the time of the patient having a revascularization of the culprit lesion, 7.5% versus 10% the primary outcome in the group in which there was a staging approach. Uh, I don't think these results reach significance in superiority, but certainly were very significant in non-inferiority, which was the basis of the study actually was non-inferiority. <coughs> then we have other aspects, which is myocardial infarction. Actually, there was superiority here. 2% in the group that was the procedure done at the time of the culprit lesion being involved in versus in 2% versus 5% in the staging. And actually, we reached the conclusions here is that in acute coronary syndrome patients with multivessel coronary artery disease, an immediate complete revascularization strategy was not inferior to a stage complete revascularization for the composite primary outcome and was associated with lower rates of myocardial infarction at one year of follow-up. I think it's an interesting study, Ed. The question is how you select the patients. You know, patients come with multivessel disease, and then the question is, if you are going to revascularize the non-culprit lesion, what lesions are you talking about? So this is the question that I have. So what do you take from the study? Well, I think uh, you bring up the point, I mean, obviously at the uh, initial uh, procedure, you also have to, uh, in, in addition to understanding the extent of their coronary diseases, the complexity and what is going to be the additional sort of uh, um, concerns related to the extending the procedure in the, in the setting of complex disease. These patients actually had complex disease. Over 60% of them had uh, B or C lesions, B, B or 2C lesions. I, I think one of the important issues here is uh, really more of a, a resource issue. Um, it has to do with uh, shortening the overall length of time of the management of these patients, uh, uh, lowering the total cost of their care by you know, avoiding a second hospitalization or procedure. Uh, and also in the United States, the, 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 the interval time in this trial was about two weeks to the in the group where there was the stage procedure. In the United States, that would be over 30 days driven by, by the economics of reimbursement, mm -hmm. which really emphasizes that patients have to wait 30 days until they have their second procedure. So I think there are some practical um, uh, insights into this trial in terms of the overall management of these patients. Um, so I, I think it is an important study. Patrick? Well, I think it's interesting. I don't think anyone would disagree with intervening on the culprit lesion, but to do it all at the same setting really makes it unrealistic to think there's going to be the opportunity for a heart team discussion about what to do with the other vessels, right? Good and point. there's no way to, the it's not realistic to have the surgeon be there at 2.15 in the morning to look at the angiogram to make a plan for the other vessels. Mm -hmm. And so I think while in the short term, one year follow-up, there may be equipoise, I'm not sure that down the road some of these patients wouldn't be better served with a staged approach so that there can be a heart team discussion about what to do with the other vessels. I would um, imagine. And I, there's no discussion of bypass, um, you know, those who go on to surgical revascularization in this. Um, the other, only as other issue I think about in these patients, with they, which they did bring up in the discussion, is just the, um, 
patients with maybe uh, chronic kidney disease or the die load of a, a complete revascularization. I th so I do think that there are some patients for whom um, staging may be more appropriate at that time, but certainly you can feel, feel good about going ahead and doing it immediately, other than, uh, as well, your point yeah. with the team. I think Patrick brings up a great point. I guess it depends on then the, the timing. Uh, as we know in STEMI patients, for example, it looks like in those patients, if they have it during the same hospitalization, the, the treatment of the, uh, the secondary lesions may not necessarily need to be at the time of the uh, culprit lesion, and that provides this opportunity mm -hmm. for that conversation. Here, the average delay is two weeks, so this implies that they've you know gone home and um, and perhaps missed that, that opportunity. So it's an issue of logistics, yeah. an issue of feasibility, yeah. an issue of the team being there discussing yeah. what patients we should do this and that, and that's basically, but the study is interesting though. Mm -hmm. At least it gives you the both opportunities. We have now to move into pulmonary hypertension, and there is one particular paper in pulmonary hypertension that I think is interesting, is the so-called stellar phase T trial a study of uh, sotatercept in combination with background therapy for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. And, and this was uh, presented by the, uh, Dr. Marius Hopper from Germany. And it is a very interesting study. Certainly, the results to me are, are fascinating. Well, first of all, what we are dealing at the molecular basis here, we are dealing, first of all, clinically patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension which is a pro progressive disease, as we know, uh, driven by pulmonary vascular remodeling. And they are talking about an imbalance into anti-proliferative type of molecular bases versus pro-proliferative. And we are talking about a drug today uh, that I mentioned that this goes into the uh, anti-proliferative part. So uh, it's, it's like uh, in one part of the balance. Uh, this is the drug, the name is Sotatercept, is an active signaling uh, inhibitor uh, and is uh, rebalancing this uh, kind of balance bo going towards the anti-proliferative effect of, of, of pathogenesis of uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. Now, this is the, these are the details of the study, the stellar study. It's a phase three randomized double-blind uh, placebo control uh, multicenter uh, study evaluate uh, sotatercept on top of a background therapy for pulmonary artery hypertension, you know, endothelial receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase, uh, prostacycline, et cetera. And in these patients' efficacy safety data to treatment uh, of 24 weeks was addressed in, in so safety, time of death, clinical worsening. So a number of clinical endpoints were part of the study. I have to say that um, I was impressed by the results here, and I can go uh, a number of variables uh, that they look at in terms of endpoints. One of the variables was the six-minute uh, walk test, and was significantly better in the Sotacert group versus the placebo group. At least uh, 40 more minutes, uh, 40 more meters could be walked in this uh, six-minute test. The pulmonary vascular resistance significantly decreased. The NT, the NT pro BMP significantly decreased. The functional class significantly decreased, um, and so forth. And then certainly all cause mortality and, uh, and progression of disease also decreased. Uh, you know, 26% versus 9% uh, in terms of progression. 26% uh, in the placebo group versus 9% in the Sotacert group. So <laughs> I have to say that I was very impressed by the <coughs> results of the study. Uh, there is one issue here, uh, bleeding events, telangiectasia, thrombocytopenia, increasing blood pressure, dizziness, was uh, certainly more significant in the Sotacert group versus the, the placebo group. So <laughs> here are the conclusions. This is a uh, first phase three trials with this drug, Sotatercept. Uh, improved the six-minute walk distance, as I mentioned, 
reduced the risk of death and non-fatal clinical worsening events by 84%. And they say the drugs were generally well tolerated. I'm not entirely sure when you read the study what you consider the toleration of the, of the drug. But certainly the final statement is these results establish the clinical utility of sotaterceb administered in combination with approved pulmonary hypertension, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension therapies as a new treatment for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So Pamela, what do you think about this? I was impressed, but I, the side effects let me a little bit down. Um, I agree. You know, I do think this is such an incredibly difficult group of patients to manage. You know, one of the things I was most interested in, you went through that list of all of the, um, uh, all of the variables that were improved. Yeah. The one, the one that was not improved was the measure of cognitive emotional uh, assessment. And it's interesting because I do see with these patients there is an overlying with with a debilitating disease like that. There is an overlying emotional. Um, uh, it's very stressful to have that sort of an illness. And I was really amazed at all the clinical variables and and uh, and. Uh, biomarker var variables that improved, but the emotional cognitive did not. So that's very interesting as we've had the discussion about quality of life, et cetera. Patrick? Not necessarily for primary pH patients, but for patients who get lung transplant in general, the average survival is about 5.2 years. That's terrible, I think. Uh, and so anything that can improve the outlook yeah. for these primary pH patients, I think is great. And it does come with some baggage, admittedly, but versus lung transplantation, this looks pretty good. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I would agree with uh, <clears throat> both Patrick and Pam that this is a patient population where they are very ill, they have, and maybe they <clears throat> don't, they're not uh, feeling well emotionally because they still have this hanging over their head, <clears throat> and it may be an ongoing uh, concern. I think it, it is interesting, it sort of circles back to uh, the discussion we had about triluminate and the uh, the importance of uh, you know patient reported outcomes in terms of feel, feeling better also was uh, interested that the actually the increase in the six minute walk was fairly substantial actually a lot greater than it was in the triluminate trial so um, uh, I think uh, this is a another <coughs> arrow in the quiver hopefully for these very complicated patients. You know, it's interesting, though, when you talk about the improvement in the six-minute walk, which was significant and highly significant, it is impressive that when you calculate it out, it's measured just over 100 feet, um, which tells you how really debilitated yep. these patients are if a statistically significant improvement is 130 or whatever feet yeah, that yeah, is. Yeah. It it's, uh, tells you just how sick they are. Right. Well, the results are impressive. Yeah. With a new drug I never heard about it, you know, and it's, it's fascinating. <clears throat> well, there are three other studies we don't have time to discuss. Was, one is in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, you know, the use of macitentin and tadalafil, they, use, is, they are using combination in these patients. And now what they develop, I suspect because adherence is always a problem, a polypill, which is the combination of both. And the drug did well. Uh, I have a number of questions about, about the study, but certainly maybe <clears throat> in the future we'll have a polypill in treating these patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Another study that I think is interesting was a phase two trial with an, uh, an oral PCSK9 inhibitor. <laughs> and, and it's fascinating, it drops the cholesterol level as well as with the drug that we inject, isn't it? Very, very fascinating, at least it's in a phase two trial. And finally, uh, I think it's interesting, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that can, they can do as much exercise as they want. Yeah. Well, this is also interesting. Well, this is basically, um, uh, I would say, a summary of what has been presented uh, in this meeting. And maybe I will ask a question to each of you. Which trial or trials you think were interesting in this meeting as a, as a final summary? Patrick? <coughs> Uh, the tricuspid, I think that's a big deal because those patients, when they're symptomatic, there's no good solutions. And if this transcatheter approach can provide at least palliation, uh, if not improve survival, I think that's a big deal. 
Tom? Well, you know what I'm going to say, <laughs> the clear outcomes trial in my area. It really opens up uh, I I additional doors for these really high risk, difficult to manage patients. It? Well, I would agree with Pam. I think uh, from a day-to-day -day practical general cardiologist uh, perspective, I would say that the clear outcome trial was really reaffirming of our LDL hypothesis mm -hmm. and also gives us, uh, you know, really something that we can offer patients who may not be taking a therapy that we know to be beneficial long term. I tend to agree with all of you. The Triluminate study, I think the tricuspid is very important. And then the clear study, I think, is very practical on a drug that is already available that we can use every day. Well, look, thank you very much. You have done very well. The only thing is not too much controversy. <laughs> I wanted to have more of a fight here, but uh, it didn't come through. Sorry. We're very agreeable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, yeah. and uh, thanks to you, the audience who are here uh, uh, to, to at least to listen to us and about this summary. It was an interesting meeting in terms of the number of subjects being approached. Mm -hmm. Most of the aspects in cardiovascular medicine were there. We didn't get into electrophysiology today, but uh, anyway, I'd like to say it was a good meeting. You, as uh, president of the American College of Cardiology, you have to be congratulated. I mean, this is a biomarker that it is good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to all of you being in the audience, and thanks to the three of you to participate with your knowledge about this, uh, the judgment of all these trials. Thank you all.